Good morning. Welcome to Southgate Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you've decided to join us, and I know the weather outside is a little tenuous, and uh, so some folks are not able to come in. In fact, if you're watching this sermon right now, in all probability, uh, Tropical Storm Grace has made it nigh to impossible for us to even be at church this morning. So uh, I miss you, but I'm glad that we have the opportunity now to be able to look into God's Word together. So God bless you, stay safe, and let's see what the Lord has for us. You know, uh, as I was looking into what to speak on, and we just finished our wonderful series in Colossians, and I thought about uh, some of the great truths that we've learned from the book of Colossians, especially in the teaching about how we're to be different in relation to our family, and husbands and wives and children and our relationship together. You know, the family is a very, very important model that God has given us. He organized us in this world not alone, uh, not separated, right? But rather to be raised in a family with a father and a mother who will care for us, who will nurture us, who will protect us, and will teach us so that when we are adults, we know what is true and good. The enemy has not missed this reality. Proverbs 17, 6 tells us, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Children's children are the crown of old men. You don't have to look too far to find grandparents that are proud of their grandkids. But also, when you look at children, maybe not when they are small, but as we grow up, we certainly learn to love and respect and recognize the value of our parents. The family is vitally important. And the family is not just important to raise good, economically sound and successful young people that will go on to better the human race. Far from that being what we're supposed to be all about, the family is supposed to teach us how to interact with God, how to love our God more, how to serve Him better. And the enemy has not missed this, not at all. And I believe it is because of this incredibly special design that God has given us that the enemy will stop at nothing to try to destroy the family, to corrupt or shatter that model that God has given us. He knows what he's after, and unfortunately, if we look around our world, I believe he has been quite successful. We look at how many families don't have a father in the home. How many families, maybe they do have a father, but he's so busy at work, he never has time for his family. Or so, how many families where both the mom and the dad are so busy living their own social life that they don't spend any time with their family life. The kids are left to raise themselves, or perhaps left to grandma and grandpa to raise. <clears throat> the kids end up spending their time running around in the neighborhood or up and down the streets playing with their friends, which is good, but without the adult supervision and watchful eye of a parent to keep them from getting into trouble. Gangs and gang violence is on the rise, drugs, alcoholism, teen pregnancy, and so many other things which are a direct result of not having parents in the, fam in the home, not having parents involved in their kid's life. I believe the enemy's been working hard to corrupt and to shatter the family. Well, if we look in the book of Daniel, we get a good picture of this. And I'd like for us now to look at Daniel chapter 1 and get an idea of why it's so important that we value and protect and fight for our families. So turn with me to Daniel chapter 1, if you will, and we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to go down through verse 4. We'll be working our way a little bit further than that this morning and hopefully continue through the book of Daniel uh, it would be nice if we could just kind of walk through the book of Daniel and see what we learn over the next coming weeks. But for now, let's start in verse 1 of chapter 1. We are told, in the, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. 
And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Nebuchadnezzar knew who he was looking for. Nebuchadnezzar had come. He'd successfully uh, besieged Jerusalem. He had captured the capital city of the nation of Israel. He had captured their king. He had expressed dominance and power over the region. But that was not enough. That could not be the only thing. No, he needed to grab further than that. He needed to grab hold of the future of the nation of Israel. So how did he do that? He told Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, he said, I want you to go and I want you to choose out the best of the best. Find their most skilled. Find their most charismatic. Find their most capable. Find their smartest, their brightest, their most promising young people and bring them back to Babylon. Bring them back to the land of Shinar. Bring them back to our country so we can educate them to be good Babylonians. Not good Jews, but good Babylonians. Not worshipers of, of the God of Israel, but worshipers of the gods of Babylon. He went for the children. He knew what he wanted. Our world is no different. Our world wants the children. They don't care so much about us, adults. After all, we're already a lost cause. The likelihood of an adult making a huge change in their views and then running with it to make a difference in the world. Uh, it's worth a news story when somebody falls from faith, when a pastor renounces his church and says, I don't believe that anymore, but not much else. But get a hold of the children and you've changed the future. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do. He wanted to change the future. In our world today, it wasn't that long ago that there were some videos that were produced and put out on social media by various uh, gay pride groups where they sang songs about how they want your children, how they said, we're out for your children, we're looking for your children, we want to get your children. Why? Because if you get the hearts of the children, then you've already won the battle. He said, go and find the children, children in whom was no blemish, well-favored, skillful. He knew what he wanted. Psalm 127.3 says, Lo, children are heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are a gift from God. God gives us children, and they are on loan from him. And what a beautiful and wonderful opportunity it is to raise these children. I have two of my own and love them dearly. Sometimes I feel that love a little stronger than others but I love them dearly. They're my kids. And any parent knows that love. They're a gift from God. They're a treasure, but they're also a great responsibility. Because when I held my daughter for the first time, when I walked out of the adoption office with my son in my arms, there was a recognition that this person was my responsibility. That I would answer to God for how I chose to raise them for what I taught them. And their choices would be largely based off of what they learned from me. There's a great responsibility in raising children. This is why the enemy wants them. This is why the enemy wants to break up the families, wants to get us so busy winning the bread and, and making the money that we're not raising our kids. And we leave it up to the school or we leave it up to their friends, or we leave it up to TV, we leave it up to anything else, that's fine. Just don't leave it up to someone who's going to bring them knowledge of God. Well, what did he want? What did Nebuchadnezzar want out of them? He wanted their charisma, right? What did he say? He said, hey, bring me these children in whom was no blemish, but well favored. Hey, bring me these kids. I want you to find the ones that are charismatic, the ones that are naturally going to be leaders, the ones that draw the attention. They look good. They're beautiful. They're perfect. 
When they walk into the room, everybody turns to look. When they open their mouth to speak, they have a natural draw to them. That's who I want. The leaders, the ones that are going to make a difference in their world. He wanted their charisma. The audacity of youth is a powerful thing. Right, That ability of a young person to step into a situation and say, well, maybe there are risks, but, and maybe I'm just too young to recognize them, but let's go and do it. Let's try it. Right? You think about uh, children and what they learn to do and how many times a child falls down before they learn to stand or they learn to walk or run, and yet they get up and they do it again anyway. They get up and they go again anyway. Think about how many times in in childhood, in uh, your teen years maybe, playing sports, and you get knocked down over and over and over. You fall. Maybe you even break a bone. You, you tear a ligament. But you go and you, you do the exercise and you wait because you can't wait till your leg is healed so you can get back out on the field and run again. Right? It's that audacity of youth that says, I'll try again. I'll keep going. I won't give up. Right? We get a little bit older and man, I'm not sure I want to tear a ligament or break a bone. <laughs> I don't think I need to be out on that field. Let the, let the kids go out and do that. But they have this incredible audacity to just do. Matthew 19, 14 says, uh, But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were trying to send the children away from Jesus, but Jesus said, No, don't. Don't send them away. Suffer them to come to me. Allow them to come. You put up with them for my sake. You invite them to come because they wanted to come. The kids wanted to come to Jesus. The kids didn't realize that, oh, Jesus is super important. You aren't supposed to get within eight feet. You're just supposed to stand there respectfully. No, they just saw him and they ran up. They wanted to give him a hug because they didn't know enough to not come to Jesus. They just wanted to come to him. And Jesus said, let them come. Right? They're willing to do. They're willing to try. They, they go for it. They don't wait and they don't overthink it. Children didn't know that they, were, they weren't supposed to come to Jesus. They just came. Sometimes it takes an adult to take a clear invitation, like come unto me and interpret it as, oh, well, first you've got to clean up your life and then maybe get in line and, and stand there respectfully at a distance and, and maybe I'll let you come up. Now, Jesus said, come unto me. And yet the adults sometimes have a harder time understanding that than the children do. Children have a natural audacity, a natural willingness to just jump in and, and go for it. That's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted. He wanted those ones with that natural charisma, with that natural enthusiasm, Deuteronomy 5, 27 to 29 says, Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of the words when ye spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. God looked at the nation of Israel and here at the beginning, in the early days when he was first drawing them to himself and making them into a nation there at the foot of the mountain. There the people willingly, they said, yes, Moses, you go and you talk to God and whatever God wants from us, we'll be willing to do it. We'll follow and we'll obey. And God looked at that and you can almost see that smile on his face with maybe a bit of sadness because he could see into the future as God would look and he'd say, oh, that there was such a heart in them. Oh, that they could just hold on to this, that they could just hold on to this enthusiasm this buying in, this willingness to say, whatever God tells me to do, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold on to that. Oh, that they would fear me and keep my commandments always. That they would, that they would always have this level of respect, this level of willingness to go with me. That it might be well with them and their children forever. What God says we will do. We'll hear it. We'll do it. This perpetual devotion can change the world. And God knew it. And our children have it. Right? They're naturally willing to do what they're told. To do as they are taught. Now, we can all be headstrong, right? 
some of you are saying, children don't want to do what they're told. Well, adults want to, don't want to do what we're told either, right? So uh, that's not just an, a part of childhood. That's a part of being human. But children naturally know they need to learn, and they look to those that they respect to learn from them. Nowadays, they look to the TV and they look to social media more than they look to their parents. But that, I think, is because parents have willingly given over that position of authority. But they have a natural enthusiasm. Nebuchadnezzar wanted that. He wanted that charisma. Hey, those of them that are, are goodly, those of them that look good, those that are going to make a difference, that have no blemish, that are well-favored, but not only that, he went on a little bit further and in that same verse 4, he says, "...and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding in science." He said, hey, I don't just want the charismatic ones. I want the ones that are smart, the ones that are going to make an impact and that can be real leaders and those that can be planners and those that are going to lead their fields. He saw their potential, not just their charisma. That's what he wanted was their potential. 2 Timothy 3, 14-17 tells us, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and thou hast, assured, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He said, hey, hold on to those things you've learned. Remember where you got them from, from your mother and your grandmother who taught you to love the Word of God because that Word of God, that's what's going to teach you and grow you and make you perfect. It's going to fill you out and give you all of the strengths so that you can be perfect, thoroughly furnished, completely furnished and capable to do all of those things. Potential. Potential. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. He wanted their skills. He wanted their smarts. Their, the impact that they could make. He wanted it for himself. Why did he want it? Because the enemy wants what is supposed to be God's. And your child's impact, the children in our community's impact, your grandchildren's impact should be for their Creator but the enemy wants it for himself. If he can steal it away, then they won't do anything for God. And that will be lost. He wanted their impact, their potential, their mutability, their changeability. Children are so easily molded, aren't they? Children are very easy to impress, to teach something to. They learn it incredibly quickly. 1 Corinthians 14.20 tells us, Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Simply put, as is always the case, our greatest strengths oftentimes cast the longest shadows. And the things that we are uh, the strongest in seem to bear a weakness that is just as big as our strength. He said, hey, don't be children in your understanding. Be mature in your understanding, as Paul here is talking to the church in Corinth, saying don't be children in your understanding because children are easily manipulated. They're easily changed. They're easily impressed by something. And if you have a childlike understanding, then you'll buy into whatever the world tells you. And then you'll be all twisted up and messed up. Don't be a child in your understanding. Lock into the Word of God. Be a man. Be an adult. Be mature in your understanding. Be a child in malice, right? Hey, we don't need to know about malice and evil and contempt, all of those things. We don't need to invest in understanding that. Hey, we don't have to go out to you know, watch a horrible movie or we don't have to go look at horrible things on the computer so that we can learn better how to avoid them. No, be a child in that. We don't need that understanding. But in your understanding of truth, don't be a child. Be mature. Settle in the Word of God. Because children are easily molded. And the enemy knows this. Why do you think Nebuchadnezzar said, bring the children? Because the children could be molded. The adults were already set. He wasn't going to change them. But the children, that's who he wanted. We have to remember that disciple, train, teach, indoctrinate, 
All of these words mean the exact same thing. Some of them we've attached a negative connotation to. Oh, we don't like indoctrinate, but it just means to teach. It just means to train, to disciple. That's what it means. We're called to teach our children, to indoctrinate our children, to put doctrine or teaching into them. The schools indoctrinate our children. That's all well and good when they're teaching them math, when they're teaching them science, when they start to teach them humanist philosophy, when they start to teach them to reject God in favor of a godless world and godless naturalism, that's a problem. But the schools indoctrinate our children. We are to teach, to indoctrinate, to train our children. Proverbs 29, 17 says, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Hey, correct your child when they're still a child, and you will get your rest. Your rest is not now, parent. Your rest is later when you can be proud of the child that turned into the adult that they will be. Right? When you can be proud of the adult that they have become. Let me put it that way. <laughs> but the rest is not now. Right now is the correction. Right now is the training. Now, right now is the teaching. That's where I'm at with my kids. It's where my, my brother and my sisters and all, all of the, the families that have little kids, that's where we are. Some of you, you've got fully grown children. And I hope that you can find rest when you consider your kids and where they're at. When you think about where they've gone and what they're doing for the Lord, that it can bring you a sense of rest. But you know what? Your grandkids aren't there yet. They still need to be raised. So correct thy son, and he will give you rest. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. He said, hey, if you spare your rod, you say, well, I don't want to correct him. I don't want to bruise his spirit. I don't want to, you know, uh, harm him in some way, so I'm not going to correct him. I'm just going to let him do his own thing and grow the way that he's going to grow. If you do that, that's not love. Love cares enough to get involved, right? When I'm walking out into the parking lot with my kids, I hold their hands. And you know what? Sometimes they squirm and they want to get their hand away, especially my son. It's going to be 11 in a couple of months. He doesn't like the idea of holding hands in the parking lot anymore. But until I know that I can trust that he's aware of the movement of cars, he's going to have to hold dad's hand in the parking lot. I don't care how old he is. It's going to happen. So I will be that dad if I need to be that dad because I need to correct my child. If I don't correct him, that's not love. Love is willing to step in and correct. Love is willing to step in and train. Love is willing to step in and rebuke. That's what we're called to do as parents. That's what we're called to do as a church. If you see a brother or sister in Christ, you see a young person that is in this body, maybe they're not your child, but you see them, and they don't have a parent who's present. Maybe they're a bus kid. Maybe they're somebody, and they don't, and they don't have a parent with them or somebody there to correct them. It is our job to teach, to train, and to correct. And not correcting. It's not love. Love cares enough to chasten. Love cares enough to correct. Proverbs 13, 24. Look down at Deuteronomy 6, 7. It says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. God said, Hey, you're to teach your children my law. At all times of the day, when you get up, when you go to sleep, when you're walking through the day, when you're at home sitting down, when you're at the table to eat, when you're in the living room, wherever you find yourself, as you go, teach your children to love God. Teach your children how to honor God with their own lives. Why? Because children are mutable. They're shapeable. But we only have so much time before that clay is going to harden. And the question is, what shape will it be in when it is finished hardening? And who will have gotten to make the imprints on them? Will it be you and I for the work of God? Or will it be the enemy, the world, shaping them into just another worldly adult? The enemy knows what he wants. But he also will spare no expense. He will spare nothing to get a hold of the children 
Daniel 1.5, what do we see? Go back to our passage. It says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. He gave them the best food. The best food in the kingdom. And Babylon was the dominant kingdom in the world at that time, in all of that known world around them, all of the the Middle East stretching to the borders of India and uh, perhaps as far as China and that region, down into northern Africa, and you have Egypt, up into the areas of uh, Turkey and Greece. That whole region, Babylon, was a world superpower. They had access to anything that they wanted. In fact, some of the great uh, wonders of the ancient world were in Babylon. They belonged to this society. They were modernized. They had everything that you could want. And he made it available. He said, hey, I'm going to give you the best food. You're going to come to my school. Maybe you're kind of sad because you had to leave home. You had to leave your little podunk town way back over in Canaan, over in the nation of Israel. You had to leave that behind and your family and all of those religious rules. And you don't have a synagogue here. But man, have I got the best food for you. Have I got the best wine for you. This would have been superior to anything that they had to eat at home. This would have blown it all away. Man, can you imagine walking in and your eyes just huge as you look around and see all the different foods, the different fruits and meats and cakes and breads and and vegetables and everything that was there, all of it spread out in a royal buffet. Literally the same food that the king would eat. That's what they got. Hey, you're important. We value you. You know what the world does a really good job of that I think we as a church do not? The world does a good job of convincing kids that they are valuable to the world. That the world knows how smart they are. That the world knows how important they are. That the world will listen to them. That they're powerful and capable. And man, if, if they could just spread their wings and fly, they would change the world. The world is really good at telling kids, you're important, you're valuable, you're capable, you're going to do so many great things. Sometimes in the church, we miss out on that. And we don't tell kids how important they are. Well, the world is good at that. He gave them the best food, the best that they could have wanted. This would have exceeded anything that their families could have given them. It was on a whole nother level. You know, Proverbs 4, verses 14 to 17 tells us, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away, for they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. He says, hey, don't go down that path. It's decorated. It's neon lit. And it's got the best looking food and the best looking wine. And it seems like it's fun and everybody's going there. But it is a path of mischief and hardship and pain and sin. And if you go down that road, you'll end up doing the same thing. And the people that are down there, they can't go to sleep at night without having done some kind of mischief during the day. And if they haven't done any mischief, then they can't sleep because they're, they're trying to figure out what to do. Don't go down that road. Temptation always dresses itself in good times and harmless fun, doesn't it? Temptation always comes to us and says, yeah, but I'm fun. Yeah, but I'm cool. Come on. It'll be okay. Nobody will know. It's just harmless fun. It's just a little joke. It's just, it's just one taste. It's just one puff. Everybody's doing it. Come on. It's just one try. If you don't like it, you can stop. Temptation always dresses itself like harmless fun. It looks like something that you wouldn't want to miss out on. Everybody else is doing that. Everybody else is jumping in. But in the end, it leaves you worse than you were before. He put before them the best of the food. He put before them the best of the wine. Hey, this wasn't just for eating. Yes, they would drink wine with their meals. It was in the ancient world, wine was very uh, commonplace in different places. Although this would have been the best of the wine. But this signified more than just a meal. This was a new social scene. This was a new life they were to live. 
No more was wine just something that you had at your meal. Now wine was available for social gatherings, for conversations on the side with a glass in your hand. This was a new social scene that these young men were brought to, that they were invited into a new world. Proverbs 5, 1 to 5 says, My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to, de to death. Her steps take hold on hell. It may seem like fun now. It may seem like everybody else is doing it now but it will lead to great pain and suffering. As these young men were brought in, these children of Israel who were good looking and they were smart and they were charismatic and they were brought into the palace, they were brought to their new residence, this great dormitory, and they saw the cafeteria stacked with a royal buffet. They must have felt like, man, Babylon gets it. Babylon knows just how important we are we are, how smart we are, how capable we are, how much of a difference we can make if we were just if we were just recognized for our value, if we were just given the chance, and man, here's the chance, and and all the all my parents' old-fashioned ways, you know, working on the farm and all the chores and just the little meager meals and, and clean animals and unclean animals, all that's gone behind because man, I've made it now, and that table, I'm gonna taste everything on it because it's there for me. A lot of Christian young people that go to secular school have an experience a lot like this. When they step onto a campus, suddenly detached from their Christian family, detached from their Bible-believing church, and now set in a secular place that says, hey, you've made it. The whole world is before you, and you can have it all, and everybody else is having it, so won't you try to? This was a new social scene. It was a new way of living. I think about Genesis 13.10. You know, the Bible tells us there in that passage, Abram and uh, Lot, their, their herds were expanding. They were growing and they had so much. And so the land was having a hard time bearing all of their animals. And, and their herdsmen were starting to fight with each other over who could have uh, water rights and who could graze in what areas. And so Abram went to Lot and he said, hey, God has blessed both of us. Uh, let's split. We'll go in different directions and you can pick the direction that you want and I'll go in the other direction and we'll be friends and we're still family, but we'll spread out so that we have more space. It's not a bad thing to do. Lot had made it. He'd succeeded. Lot had his own family. It was time for Lot to spread a little bit. But you know what Lot did? In verse 10, the Bible says, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. He remembered Egypt. Egypt, that picture of the world so often in the Bible. Egypt, that place that Abram had brought Lot and Sarah, his wife, down to in a failure to trust God for their provision. He went to Egypt during a famine rather than to trust that God would care for them. And while Lot, this young and impressionable young man, while he was in Egypt, he saw the way of the Egyptians. He saw all that the Egyptian lifestyle could bring. Man, beautiful women, great food, all of these you know, exotic perfumes and smells and customs and ways of life and gold-plated idols and, and just all of this exotic beauty that was there to behold that was not a part of his uncle Abram's lifestyle. And now, as he gets to choose where he's going to go, he looks and he sees the plain of Jordan, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he says, man, that looks like Egypt. And that's where he goes. He was drawn to its beauty and its success. 2 Timothy 4.10 tells us, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, and Titus unto Dal Dalmatia. Now these next two, Crescens and Titus, there's no reason to believe that they had abandoned Paul as Demas had. 
But Demas, very specifically, he says, he hath forsaken me. Now, Demas, if you remember our sermon when we finished the book of Colossians, Demas was one of the guys who was mentioned in the end of Colossians, who was with Paul. And yet, here we are, and Paul says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. That's why. Because he loved the world more than he loved God. And so when time came, he pushed off for the world. He went in that direction. That's what the enemy wants to do to draw our children away, to cause them to fall in love with this world and with its technology and its media so that they will be unable to follow God and leave that all behind. He gave them the best food, the best wine, and he gave them the best time. Notice he didn't expect a change right away. What did he say? He appointed... The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. Three years, that's a college degree right there, right? I mean, we go for four years. Some people, uh, you can get associates in two years. Some people finish an entire uh, bachelor's degree in three years, right? But three years is a good chunk of time. He said, we're going to give them three years of the best meat and the best wine and this new social environment and everything brought to them and given to them. Think about where we were three years ago and ask yourself, are you the same person you were three years ago? Would you want to go back to where you were three years ago? Maybe in some areas, right? (laughs) But not in technology. I mean, can you remember the iPhone from three years ago? Man, that thing was so slow, right? Can you, you remember internet? It's so slow. Can you? There's many things that we don't want to go back to. And he said, let's give them three years. You know, it takes time to change a generation. You don't change people overnight. You don't change them just like that. It takes time to work that slow magic of change over them. This was a carefully planned assignment. Hey, you're going to give them the best food. You're going to give them the best wine. You're going to let them taste everything that Babylon has to offer them. And you're going to just don't don't apply any pressure. Just invite them. Just love them. Just accept them. Just be excited with them. And just slowly turn up the heat. Just crank it up slowly over three years. Because you don't change a generation in a day. Psalm 126, 5, 6. 5 to 6 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. We are too impatient in the church. See, we start something and we want revival in a day. We want to preach one sermon and then have everybody catch revival like it's COVID-19, right? And then just take it out into the world and share it and suddenly the whole world is in our next church service right and if we don't have half the island packing out the building the very next sunday man i guess revival's not coming and we give up too easy we give up too fast the enemy is not nearly so hasty he says give me your children give them a tv give them a tablet send them to public school and then send them to aftercare right From K-5 to 25. From kindergarten to finished college. Just let us have them. Put them in. Hey, start them in Head Start. Start them at three years old, right? Give them to us early. You don't have to teach them. Hey, parents, take that weight off of your shoulders. You're so tired from working those hours. Why should you invest in your kids? Just let them watch TV and be on the internet the whole time. Give them a cell phone so we can get them plugged into social media even faster. So they can start watching TikTok and Instagram. So they can start following people that you don't even know who they are. But man, they read every single tweet that that person puts out. Give them their own connection to the world so that they don't need you for that anymore and then let them be in the public system so the world can teach them look i know that there's godly people that teach in the public schools and i'm not trashing on the public schools specifically here but we have given up our young people we have given up the children of the next generation to the world and we expect that the world is going to give them back that's not going to happen 
we have to take them back. Luke 8.14 says, That which fell among thorns are they which when they had heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. The weeds didn't choke them overnight. No, it just took time. It was much more subtle than that. The weeds grow up slowly, like the slow warming water that boils a frog, right? You just turn the water up slowly, 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 and the frog never notices that the water is getting warmer and warmer until it's so paralyzed by the heat that it can't jump out, and then it just boils. Some of us, unfortunately, are as paralyzed as our children by this modern culture. So we're in no condition to save them at all because we are just as trapped as they are. The enemy knows what he wants. He knows how to get it. He knows what he's working towards. He's not going to spare any expense to reach them. And when he reaches them, he will redefine their identity. That's so important. It's a big deal now. Identity. Hey, what do you identify as? Are, do you identify as a man? Do you identify as a woman? Do you identify as a, as a flagpole? Do you identify as, uh, uh, as an Asian? Or do you identify as a fluid trans? What, uh, what do you identify as? What's your identity? It, it's not attached to who you are anymore. It's attached to what you feel like. Right? The enemy wants to redefine our children in a picture that does not include God. Daniel 1, verses 6-7. to seven. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Hey, that's not a big deal, right? I mean, you go into a different culture. Sometimes your name is hard to pronounce. So you get kind of a nickname, right? Or you get a, a rewording, kind of a repronouncing of that name, right? Something like that. I'm sure that's what it is. Oh, no. Oh, no. It was much worse than that. It was much more intentional than that. This was an undermining of their family faith of their national faith, their history, who they were before God. You see, Daniel literally means God is my judge. That's what that name means. It was a declaration that said that God is my judge. I stand before God. He's the one who is my authority and I will answer to him. That's Daniel's name. His parents didn't give it to him by accident. But Belteshazzar means keeper of the treasures of Bel, who was a pagan false God. So, oh, no, no, you're not going to be judged by God, Daniel. God is not your judge. No, no, you are going to be a keeper of the treasures that Bell has given you. It's a re-identification. They renamed him. Hananiah literally means the grace of the Lord. His name, Shadrach, means inspiration of the sun, who was also worshipped. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not about the grace of the Lord. You, you are about the inspiration of the Son. You, you don't need the Lord in your life. You don't need that old Jehovah, that old God of Israel. You don't need His grace. No, no, no. You, you can be an embodiment of the inspiration of the Son. Let's stick with that. Let's get God out of the picture. Well, what about Mishael? Mishael means he that is the strong God. It was a it was a testament of God's strength and God's capability. Hey, I'm going to turn to God, the one who is strong, the one who is capable in my life. Oh, no, 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 oh, Mishael, he that is a strong God. It's, that's such a masculine, uh, you know, I mean, that's, it's kind of, it's that whole patriarchy thing, Mishael. We gotta, we're going to change your name to of the goddess Shack. Yeah, that sweet moon goddess. You don't need to be about that strong, masculine God, Jehovah. You can be all about that sweet moon goddess named Shaq. We'll change your name from Mishael to Meshach. That's a good name. 
What about Azariah? The Lord is a help. Good name. I don't think very many people are named these names anymore. <laughs> but Azariah means the Lord is a help. A reminder that when we need help, that's who we should turn to, is the Lord. Oh, no, no, no. You don't need the Lord to help you. Instead, you can be a servant of the shining fire. You can be a bednigo. You can serve the fire, the flame, another pagan idol that they would worship. So each of them had their Hebrew name that honored God, that focused their life and found their identity in their relationship to their Creator. And they were re-identified by Babylon in a way that connected them with a false god, that removed their connection to the God of their people. This was undermining of the family faith. Proverbs 22.1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Hey, your name is important. It identifies you, right? It's on our documents. But it's more than just a name on your documents. It not only identifies you, it defines you. It is who you are. And a good name is better than being rich. It's better than a bank full of dollars. To have a good name because that's what people know about you when they hear your name they think of you and who is the person they think of that's your good name do you have a good name a good name is worth more than great riches god many times gave names as a way of declaring someone's identity abram became abraham the father of the nation jacob became israel he went from being a thief to being a prince Saul became Paul. He went from being the killer and persecutor of the church to being the apostle to the Gentiles. God oftentimes renames us to re-identify us. And in fact, all of us have a name written down in glory. That is your identity. It's not this human fleshly body and this existence that is racked by sin all around us this is not our identity my identity who i am is written in the book of life in heaven right now that's who i am as a child of god that's who you are that's who our children are but the world the enemy in this world is going to work hard to re-identify them according to his terms and in a way that excludes their God, that excludes the Creator and the Savior. Not only did he undermine the family faith, he also wanted to cultivate a worldly image. You know, each of these names was focused on the world, was focused on physical, carnal things, things in nature, the moon, fire, the sun, right? All of these things. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. As a child of God, that's not who we are anymore. This physical world is not it. But the enemy would have us re-identify ourselves with this physical world. There's a battle for the identity of our children. And God would offer them an identity in Christ. The enemy will offer them an identity in this world. Romans 6.16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Whoever you choose to obey in this life, that's who you make master over you. Christian or not, whoever you serve, that's your master. If you serve God, if you turn your heart to the Lord, if you choose to honor Him with your life, to live your life in a way that, that pleases Him, then praise the Lord. Then you are serving unto righteousness. You're serving in the Spirit. You are serving to life. But if you choose to spend your life to whittle it away, chasing this world and its pleasures, then you're just serving sin, which leads to death. It's entirely possible for us to wander away back into the gutters and back into the sin that we were saved out of. I believe that. And the enemy wants to tempt us away. He wants to drag us away, to, I should say, to draw us away. He's much more subtle than to grab hold and to drag us off. But he wants to tempt us away. He wants to draw us away from our new identity in Christ and cause us to forget who we are in Jesus children of God, co-heirs 
of the kingdom of God. The enemy wants our children to trade their identity in Christ away or to choose never to accept it at all. The saddest part is that it's largely been a successful plan. You know, if you read on in the rest of Daniel, and we'll get there in the coming weeks, Daniel and his friends choose to stand and praise the Lord for that. But they are the only ones. Out of all of the wisest and most charismatic and most intelligent young people of the nation of Israel, all of them taken away to Babylon, only four chose to resist this new identity that was put on them. And from here on, they're the only four that seem to stand out and make any difference for God at all. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8-10 through 10 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. That deceivableness is already in them. When the Antichrist comes, have you ever wondered how in the world will the Antichrist rise to power? I mean, literally, the Bible calls him the Antichrist and tells us he's a great supervillain, right? He's, how in the world will, the, will this be missed? How will the world receive him with open arms and allow this to happen? It's because that deceivableness is already in them. They've already accepted what the world has to offer. They've already allowed the world to redefine and re-identify them as a part of the world. And so with that deceivableness already in their hearts, they're primed to accept the lie. They've already surrendered the truth. Verse 10, it says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They've already rejected the truth. So when the lie comes, they're primed to accept it. Romans 16, 17 to 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Even within broader Christianity, and I have to say broader Christianity because it's what the world labels as Christian. And we know that Christian refers to somebody who is a child of God. Right? So not every church is a Christian church. Not every pastor is a Christian pastor. Not every church member or deacon or Sunday school teacher. Not everyone who wears the label of Christian and says, Oh, I, I'm a believer. I walk by faith does not mean that they know Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said that in that day, many will come and they'll say, Lord, Lord, we did all these things for you and, and why won't you let us in? And Jesus will say, because I never knew you, right? There's something more to it. So there are plenty of people who are in the church that the world would say, oh, they're Christians. That's a Christian church. That's a Christian denomination. They're Christians, that broader Christian term, right? But within that, there are already those within that broader Christianity who have compromised with the world. They've already exchanged the truth of God in order to get along in the world. They've accepted the, the fouled up thinking of mankind. They've allowed sin to come in and they have celebrated it and said that it's good, that it's okay, that it should be supported and allowed and that... that all of these things should be brought in because, man, we just got to love people. And they kick out the truth of God. They give up the truth in order to accept those lies so that they can get along with the world. And when you compromise with the world, you let the lie replace the truth. And then what have you left? There's already those. And here in Romans 16, he said, hey, avoid them. Note them because these are not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachers are only serving their belly. They're just serving their own desire for power, for money, for fame, for platitudes. And they just want people to praise them. They want to be the face of Christianity in America. Some big TV preacher or somebody who's written another book, some big social media guru, somebody who has lots of followers. That's what they want. 
Well, I'd rather be a follower of Jesus than have a million followers of me. That's the way it ought to be. But they draw others after them. Matthew seven thirteen to 14 Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. God offers us one way. One way to find life. One way to escape death. The enemy has done a great job of cluttering the scene. The world is full of so many paths that promise good things. Oh, you can follow Buddha, and you can follow Hinduism, and you can follow your heart, and you can follow this, and you can follow that, and you can follow all these different ways, and there's all sorts of different plans, and you can just be who you want to be. Then all the roads, they're they're all going to lead to the same place anyway. Well, they all lead to the same place except for one, because only one of them leads to heaven. The enemy's done a great job of cluttering this world with so many paths that promise good things, but they can only lead to death. Broad is the way. There's a lot of different lanes that lead to hell. There's only one that goes to heaven, and it goes through the door that is Jesus Christ. That's what we have to teach our kids. That's what we have to get into them. We have to share with them. Just yesterday, There was a training over close to the St. George's Botanical Garden for people on St. Croix that would want to get involved with going out into our communities to reach the children through Bible clubs, through Good News clubs, to be able to go out and share the gospel with them, to teach them and to train them, and to win them back for God. Because the enemy is working hard. We say, man, I'm not sure I can give an hour a week. I'm not sure I can give two hours a week to go and reach some kids, to go and reach some people. That's okay. Think about it this way. How many hours are in a day? 24. Okay. How many hours are in a week? I'll let you do that math. Now, if you only give one hour a week, how many hours does that leave the enemy? Hey, he's happy with that trade-off. If we sit by and make excuses not to go out and to reach the kids. That's who the enemy is aiming for. And he's getting them because we're not. Because the church is sitting still. And we should not be. We can't lose a minute. The enemy has been hard at work. And we see the fallout of this everywhere that we look. The waters have become so muddled that truth is rejected in favor of a felt experientialism. Biology, history, tradition, all of that means nothing. Instead, there's no truth. But where does that leave the one who is the truth? If there is no truth, it's all just based on your experience, then Jesus being the truth means nothing. That's just his experience. I guess I'm the truth too. And you're the truth too. And we can all be the truth together, and then it doesn't matter. We can all be our own way the truth and the life, right? And we've ruined it. That's what the enemy wants. So don't miss this. It's not an accident. It's time to fight back. The enemy is working hard. Just like Nebuchadnezzar so long ago, he knew how to get a hold of the children, the next generation of Israel. Hey, I'm going to get their strongest. I'm going to get their brightest. I'm going to get their most charismatic, the ones that will be natural leaders. And I'm going to get a hold of them, and I'm going to train them to be good Babylonians so that when they grow up and they lead the next generations, I will own those people for centuries, for generations. They'll be mine because I will have changed their way of thought in the next generation. The enemy is doing the exact same thing right now. When the enemy teaches our kids that you can identify yourself as anything that you want, that Christianity is outdated, bigoted, that it's repulsive, that it doesn't fit with this modern world and that they should be celebrated for rejecting it, and taking anything else, we need to fight back. We need to claim our children for God again. It's time to be active about the work of reaching children in our communities, because if we pass on this, the enemy won't. So we're going to pray, and we'll close our time. I hope that this has been a challenge to you. I'm not sure if it's been a blessing. 
but it should be a challenge. Because if you've got children in your home, the enemy wants your kids. If you've got grandchildren, the enemy wants your grandchildren. If you've got kids on your street, in your neighborhood, kids at your school, the enemy wants those kids. And unless we do something to get them first, then he'll go snatch them up. He's already reaching them. What about us? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would forgive us as a church for being so slow to reach out and to touch the hearts of the children and the adults in our community. Lord, there are so many that are lost that don't have hope. They don't know who you are, and so they are blindly following the enemy deeper and deeper into the world. They don't realize that their identity has already been changed, that they've already been swallowed up. Lord, I pray that the glorious light of your gospel will break through the darkness, will show them a better way. Lord, I pray that you will use us to reach them. I pray, Lord, for August 28th, for the Christmas in August uh, gospel event with Child Evangelism Fellowship, that as many clubs are planned for that day so that children can be reached with the gospel. Lord, I pray that that will spiral forward into regular clubs that meet in different neighborhoods and communities where children can hear the gospel and be taught. But Lord, it's not just for the children. As much as the children are mutable and they are the future, Lord, there are so many men and women, adults, parents, uncles, grandparents, aunts, all of them, Lord, our friends and our neighbors that do not know you as their Savior. And Lord, their time is running out, so put a fire in our hearts to change our community for you, to be busy, Lord, being identified for you. Lord, I pray that the world would not be able to identify us, that the world would not be able to somehow label us as Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal or white or black or this or that or all the other things. Lord, that's not our identity. Our identity is saved. Child of God. Lord, let that be our identity. And let us cling to that. Teach us, Lord, to love you, to love your people, and to love this world that needs so desperately to know you. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us once again. I hope that you're safe. If you're in the Caribbean, it's uh, probably a little bit rainy and wet today. So provided that you had enough power to be able to watch along with us, uh, then I say God bless you. Stay safe. Uh, take this to heart. And beg God to show you how you can reach your community for Him. Have a great day.